Good morning. I am delighted to welcome you all to this inaugural Rhodes Policy Summit on Pandemic Preparedness. Welcome to all of our esteemed participants here in the room and also to everybody who's joining us online. I am Dr. Helena Marie van der Westhuizen. I'm the Global Health Fellow at the Rhodes Trust and I also work with the Global Health Security Consortium. The depth of experience and expertise gathered together for the summit is exceptional and it reflects the commitment that many individuals and organizations have made to translate what we have learned during the COVID-19 pandemic into actionable and impactful strategies to better prepare for the next crisis. We have a wide variety of geographies, disciplines, and generations represented among the speakers and attendees today. And this is central to the work of the Rhodes Trust to ignite the power of convening across traditional boundaries and to drive collaboration for impact. On that note, I would like to say, express my gratitude to the Warden of the Rhodes Trust, Dr. Elizabeth Kish, um, who was instrumental in making this policy summit possible. Um, she sends her apologies, she's not able to join us in person today, but hopes that we have fruitful conversations. In particular, I would also like to welcome and thank Dr. Philip Ma for his leadership support for the summit. We've also been hugely privileged to have the Global Health Security Consortium as knowledge partner for this event. The Global Health Security Consortium was formed during the COVID-19 pandemic as a joint initiative between three organizations, and we are honored to have the principals of all three of those organizations with us today. So a special welcome to Tony Blair, Executive Chairman of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, and former Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, to Dr. David Agus, Founding Director and CEO of the Lawrence J. Ellison Institute for Transformative Medicine, and to Sir John Bell, Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford University. With political and public attention for pandemic preparedness shifting from the panic that was characterized the early response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we now see neglect and you are here today because you've recognized these two extremes as a problem. There is a need to embed in our routine systems and processes the capacities that we need to face a new crisis. And this is what we hope to achieve during today's summit, to collaborate on building a positive legacy from the COVID-19 pandemic. We would like you to be part of the conversation at the summit, so you will be able to submit questions to the moderators of the panel discussions through our conferencing app. To download it, you can scan the barcode at the back of your name tag, and you can also join us on social media um, using the hashtag Pandemic Policy Summit. We hope that you enjoy this opportunity to connect and that it may lead to new initiatives and collaborations. As our first speaker on today's program, I would now like to introduce Sir John Bell, who is also representing the Rhodes Trust as the Chair of the Rhodes Trustees, and who led the advisory board for the summit. Sir John has played a leadership role in the COVID-19 pandemic response and in advocating for the world to be better prepared. Sir John, over to you. So, um, look, welcome everybody. We're, this, we've got a really great day lined up with some terrific speakers, but also some great discussions. And as you know, the Rhodes Trust has supported this summit to try and get people to focus again, well, maybe for the first time, on how we prepare ourselves for the next potential pandemic. And I, just as a preview to this, I think most of us who were involved, and many of you in the audience were involved in the management of the last pandemic, uh, generating lots of the tools that were used and uh, creating the public response that really allowed us to get on top of that. And I think there's been a general sentiment that the speed at which uh, political leadership has vacated the space of pandemics has been absolutely eye-watering. And so globally, there's really not a massive effort to think about the next pandemic and you know look I think we all get climate change I don't think there's any doubt that that's on our list but 
They, they used, Gerald Ford used to say that, you know, politicians could think and chew gum at the same time. And you would have thought that they might be able to do pandemics and climate change at the same time. So I think that's one of the things that I think we need to do today is to think about how we can reinvigorate the discussion around what do we do about being ready for the next pandemic. So um, what I'd like to do is just quickly introduce a theme which will come back and forth, which has been really driven by the Global Health Security Consortium over the last couple of years, and that is the concept that if we're going to be ready for the next pandemic, one of the things we've learned is it's very difficult to turn everything on from baseline. You've got to be, at some level, ready for the event. And we know that the last pandemic was bad, but we also know, and I, we're, I'm looking forward to Rasmus's talk in a minute, but we, we do know that it could have been a lot worse. And it turned out, fortunately, that COVID was actually approachable using vaccines. We could move things into speed. We managed it pretty well. But there are other scenarios with a more aggressive pathogen which wouldn't look good. And what we did learn was that having not really experienced a pandemic in, in recent history, there was really not a lot of existing expertise as to how to get to where we needed to get to. So most things had to start from nothing, and we needed to build up testing, genomics, vaccines, drugs, and everything from scratch. And, and that, I think, gave us really good evidence that starting and stopping these things is not a great way to, to do this. You really want to have stuff which is operating continuously in a healthcare system without a pandemic, so that when a pandemic comes, it could pivot into those capabilities. Uh, and that includes the identification of pathogens, capacity for manufacturing, which is always on, deployment capabilities, as we saw globally for vaccines, and, and a clinical research capability. So if you think about all the things we did in the last four years, three, three and a half years, these are all things that we would have to do again. But the intention is not to start each one of these things from scratch, but to have things that are operating that support a wider health agenda that could be pivoted quite quickly into that space. Now, that's everything from the early identification of pathogens and, and prevention through the creation of new tools, scaling those up, uh, testing and evaluating those, manufacturing and scaling those, all the way through monitoring the progress of the pandemic and shifting as it changes over time. And, and I think the game here is going to be to try and create those capabilities on a global basis. So as we found out, it doesn't really work if you just do this in Western Europe and North America. So the system really does have to be always on, um, and it needs to be based around routine activities in a health system, which basically means we have to strengthen our health systems to think more about the prevention agenda and how we would respond to a pandemic if it would uh, occur. And of course, there are a set of things that we would need. Life course vaccination, of course, is one that we've talked about uh, a lot the uh, pathogen identification capabilities so we can be uh, early to identify the pathogen involved, and of course, digitized healthcare systems. So uh, there are really three, those three examples are the ones that I want to spend just a little bit of time um, this morning on. A and I think it's important to realize that what we can do today looks completely different than what we could have done 10 years ago. And I think this is a really important point. So you, we can be very critical about pandemic planning as of 2013, 2014. But the reality is a lot of these tools weren't actually available to us then. So it's probably unfair to say that these could have been in place. On the pathogen surveillance side, of course, the big game changer is the availability of genomic sequencing at low cost and also portable and district distributable as with the Oxford Nanopore technology. So the ability to have bedside genomic precise diagnostics scaled and distributed globally is going to make a massive difference. And I'll come back to that in a minute. On the vaccine side, I think one of the interesting things is that in the last, and this didn't start with COVID, it started before COVID, but in the last 10 years, we've seen a massive uh, a flood of new technologies and new vaccines that are becoming available to treat some of the major infectious diseases. And some of those are not necessarily pandemic pathogens, but they might be things like dengue, the new malaria vaccine, those sorts of things are really important and powerful technologies. 
So there is a whole pool uh, and pipeline of vaccines that could fuel a completely different approach to healthcare systems, which is prevention-oriented and focused around vaccines and injectables. And then on clinical research infrastructure, this I think is, is terribly important because one of the problems about the inequity of the last pandemic where the northern economies did well and the global south was in many cases left behind was the, the inavailability of clinical research capabilities in many bits of the world. And I think that's just wholly inappropriate and something that needs to be fixed so that we can move quickly into trials we can get those countries to participate. We can generate better data relevant to the local environment and the local population. And that will also do much to reduce the vaccine hesitancy agenda. And digitization, of course, has been the crucial piece that makes that eminently possible. So just to quickly whip through those three domains, pathogen surveillance. So one of the problems with pathogen surveillance, which has been interesting to observe, is when people talk about pathogen, everybody talks about something different. So they're about five or six different, and, and they're all interesting and important ways of delivering pathogen surveillance. All of them will be enabled by genomic sequencing, so that's helpful. Um, first of all, you do need large global sets of data, but it's really important to remember that those are simply what they are. They're large global sets. They don't tell you anything about the disease. They don't tell you about the phenotype. They don't tell you anything about the sort of things you need to know if you're going to try and predict or manage a pandemic but they are a really good way of tracking variation in pathogens. What is much more important, though, is the ability to identify the pathogen as early as possible, and there are really two ways to do that. One is environmental sampling, and this is, it could be largely based around sewage analysis, and I, I think that's an interesting thing which I'm not gonna talk about. But the other area is that you really do need to think about how all hospitals, and in particular ITUs globally, could actually have point of care diagnostics that told them what was the cause of that severe pneumonia in the patient in bed three in the intensive care unit in Ho Chi Minh City. So, and, and the, the delay in those, those diagnostics is a really serious issue. And so if you can start to convert clinical microbiology to a genomically driven enterprise where the diagnostics is done based on genome sequence of the pathogen, then then all hospitals will have it, and they won't have it necessarily to deal with pandemics. They'll have it to deal with the day-to-day -day flow in the hospital. But of course, because it's there, it'll get used to identify these pathogens at a, at, at a much faster pace. Uh, and so on pathogen surveillance, we really do need to build into the workflow of clinical microbiology generally a genomic arm that's used routinely. And Given the fact that microbiology, and I'm sorry about this, I think there are crooks in the audience, but I'm sorry to be a bit abusive about clinical microbiology, but they are still using petri dishes, which were invented in 1860, and, and flames and those little loops, which I think were probably invented in the Middle Ages. So the, <laughs> anyway, we're, Derek, of course, is a big mover to try and push this on, as are many others, but this is a really crucial step that we need to take. Now, the concept of life course vaccination is one that I think is raised its head, and, and I have to give here credit to Pravat Jha, who in the middle of the pandemic rang me up and he said, JB, what we need is an adult vaccination program, because at the moment, childhood vaccination is really well organized, and adult vaccination, not at all. So how do we do that? And with our colleagues in the Global Health Security Consortium, we've been pushing a campaign, which has actually now had significant traction in about a dozen countries, which is to say, we need to go back to what we had in COVID. Light touch, community-based centers run not by doctors, but by other types of health professionals where you can get your vaccines or your preventative interventions, mostly injectables, and they can be done cheaply and they can be bundled into, into single centers. And, and they can run as a major bit of the public health agenda and that will provide an opportunity to have those in place as a routine part of our public health agenda so that if we ever get another pathogen which is causing a pandemic, you could just activate those and swing new vaccines into action very, very quickly. And so the, the idea of the one-shot program is really to, first of all, help improve equity around the world to vaccines and other things, but to reorient the healthcare system. So 
I think one of the other issues about healthcare systems is they're ve not very prevention oriented, but this would be a really good way to pivot health systems so that they thought much harder about the preventative interventions that you can give to people. They're safe, you don't need a doctor's consultation, you don't need to make an appointment to see the GP, you can just get on, pop down to the local center and get your jab. I mean, that, what, what, the, the only problem with a one shot idea is it's not one shot, it's about 10 shots, but anyway, <laughs> the, you know the marketing guys, they, they make it simple. Um, um, so, and this is the kind of thing you can imagine. I mean, these are all, many of these are new uh, um, uh, long-acting injectables or vaccines, all of which could be bundled in these public health centers. And, and that actually gives us a new way to think about public health and prevention, including, you know, the, the new vaccines, RSV, dengue, hopefully soon a TB vaccine, malaria, which isn't on this in some bits of the world, but also long-acting retrovirals, injectable contraception, long-acting antipsychotic drugs, and the siRNAs for cardiometabolic disease. These are all long-acting injectables. You don't need a consultation. Somebody just needs to say you need it, and then you need to pop down and get a hole in your arm. So, um, and, and that could also be built in to make sure that the manufacturing capabilities that we're busy building are hooked up to these vaccine hubs and these deployable things so that you always keep the manufacturing capability buzzing along and delivering uh, at scale so that the vaccine hubs have all these products to use. And then if somebody, you know, if we get an avian flu, somebody makes a, Andy Pollard and his colleagues make a vaccine, um, you can pivot immediately and get that into the system, take over the manufacturing, run it through the deployment capability. And that I think will be a hugely beneficial step in preparing for what we need. And the third aspect is this clinical research infrastructure. And this is a nice table that Gabriel Seidman put together for us. But you know, one of the real problems in equity of, of distribution of clinical activities in the last pandemic was the fact that there was very little clinical trial capability in Africa. You know, Africa gets about 4% of the global clinical trials. It carries the biggest burden of disease uh, and a very substantial population. So there is an interesting question about how we globalize clinical research. And of course, there are a number of tools that will let us do that much easier. But in clinical research, we've got this amazing pipeline. It would be a bit crazy if we were trying to develop many of those things, the TB vaccine, the malaria vaccine, the dengue vaccine, without using clinical trial capabilities in the developing world. So that becomes very important. We also need to start to take non-communicable diseases as a, another issue for clinical research in the, in the developing world, as they are a major source of uh, premature death and mor morbidity. Uh, and so I think we, we have to work together to think about how we can build out those possibilities. And of course, that's facilitated now with much better digital technology, which will allow us to do this in a completely different way than we would have done it 10 years ago. And the potential for both economic benefit and uh, lives saved will not surprisingly be enormous. So um, just to conclude, I think always on is just one concept in the whole pandemic preparedness agenda, but it's a terribly important one because I think if we don't have a system, a health system in all countries, both global north and global south, that's resilient enough that you're running it all the time and you can then move and pivot it quickly into a pandemic scenar scenario. We're gonna see the same problems as we did with the COVID pandemic. And I think this will, at the same time preparing it for a pandemic, should greatly enhance healthcare for everybody all over the world on a day-to-day -day basis. And what's not to like about that? So look, thanks very much um, for listening. And, and now I think we should turn to our, that, I'm the warm up act. We're gonna now turn to our major speaker who needs almost no introduction and, and that's Tony Blair, um, 